This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good afternoon and welcome to this inaugural event in the McDonald Distinguished Scholars Lectures on Christian Scholarship. It's a privilege to see all of you here. Thank you so much for coming. My name is John Witte. I serve as director of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion here at Emory University, one of the two co-hosts of today's forum. Our center is dedicated to studying some of the religious sources and dimensions of fundamental questions of law, politics, and society. We work with some 100 faculty from around the campus and 1,600 scholars from around the world. The center offers a variety of research projects and publications, a leading journal and a couple of book series, a number of specialized courses and degree programs, and a variety of public forums such as this one. Our center's work has been deliberately Abrahamic to date, focusing on law and religion themes in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, separately and comparatively considered. And we are also drawing in new work dealing with our friends in the Asian religions and indigenous traditions. But this new Distinguished Scholars Lecture Series focuses on one critical aspect of our work, cutting edge Christian scholarship on issues of law, politics, and society. And we're deeply honored to co-host this event and the series of lectures that follow with our friends from the McDonald Agape Foundation. This remarkable family foundation, now 25 years old, has been supporting leading Christian scholars and projects at elite universities, Harvard, Yale, Chicago, Duke, Oxford, Cambridge, and Emory. And this five-year lecture series will feature the work of a number of the distinguished scholars whom the foundation has supported generously over the past quarter century. Our lecture series has been made possible by the vision and the generosity of one of the proudest sons and alumni of Emory University, U.S. Ambassador and Emory Trustee Emeritus Alonzo L. McDonald. It's been a privilege for me to get to know Al McDonald over the years and to witness his sage and shrewd advice and leadership of church, state, and society. And it's been a singular honor for me for the past decade to sit in a chair and to stand at distinguished lectures and lecterns here and abroad that bear his good name and that of his family. As a businessman, Alonzo McDonald headed the Bendix Corporation, McKinsey and Company, the Avenir Group, and he taught for a number of years at Harvard Business School. As a political leader, he served as a U.S. Special Ambassador to Geneva, negotiating the GATT Trade Treaty and a number of other private international documents which still govern our international commerce today. He was also appointed with Hamilton Jordan as Chief of Staff of President Jimmy Carter's White House. As a religious leader, he was founder with Os Guinness of the Williamsburg Charter Foundation and the Trinity Forum, and has been a generous underwriter and supporter of cloisters and monasteries, of parishes and ministries throughout North America and Western Europe. We owe a great deal to Alonzo McDonald for his generous support, for his creative vision, and for his wise leadership. And I hope I won't embarrass you too much Mr. Ambassador, if I ask you to stand and receive our robust applause in recognition and thanks to you. <laughs> Fifty years ago, the world welcomed some of the most remarkable human rights documents that it had ever seen. The United States Congress, governing some 280 million souls at the time, passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. This was America's final statutory rebuke to its long and tragic history of racism, chauvinism, nativism, and religious and cultural bigotry. These acts declared anathema on all manner of discrimination in the voting booth, in public and private accommodations, in schools, and in the workplace. And they called on American courts and American citizens to give full and faithful protection to the rights of everyone, regardless of race or color or religion or sex or national origin. Fifty years ago, the Second Vatican Council, speaking for a billion plus Catholics around the world, 
opened up a new chapter in its ministry and mission in a series of sweeping new papal and conciliar documents with exotic Latin names like Pacum in Terris and Dignitatis Humanae and Gaudium et Space and Lumen Gentium, amongst others. Rejecting the anti-democratic and anti-rights posture of the earlier church, particularly as crystallized in the syllabus of errors, the church now taught that all human beings are created by God with dignity, intelligence, and free will, and have rights flowing directly and simultaneously from their very nature. Such rights include the right to life and adequate standards of living, to moral and cultural values, to religious activities, to assembly and association, to marriage and family life, and to various social, political, and economic opportunities. The church emphasized the religious rights of conscience, worship, assembly, and education, calling them the first order rights of any civic order. The church also emphasized the need to balance individual and associational rights, particularly involving the neighborhood, the family, the school. And it urged the abolition of discrimination on grounds of sex and color and social distinction, language, or religion. And it called on clergy and laity alike to be ambassadors and advocates for the rights of all persons, especially the most needy and the most vulnerable amongst us, the least of these, as the scripture puts it. And 50 years ago, the United Nations, embracing 186 nation states at the time, passed the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Social, Cultural, and Economic Rights. Only two decades before these great covenants, the world had stared in horror into Hitler's death camps and Stalin's gulags, where all sense of humanity and dignity had been brutally sacrificed. The world had just seen the slaughter of 60 million people in six years of military savagery. And in response, the world had seized anew on the ancient concept of human dignity claiming this as the Ur principle of a new world order. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 opened its preamble with classic words, recognition and the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. The 1966 International Covenants reiterated this founding premise of human dignity and then sought to translate these grand declarations words into particular deeds and obligations for every nation state and every citizen therein. The goal of our forum today is to celebrate these, this half century anniversary of these monumental documents. But it's also to analyze and debate the question whether one faith tradition, Christianity, in all of its denominational diversity has, can, and should, or should not, offer something to this regime of human rights. For nearly two millennia, we lawyers, jurists, advocates, judges, have talked easily about subjective rights and freedoms and capacities. In the old Roman law days, these were called jura, libertates, facultates, and Roman lawyers and civil lawyers and canon lawyers alike use these languages easily. Of the ninth century, those began to be translated in Anglo-Saxon into the concept of rita. Rita became the prototype for right, and rights then gathered freedoms and capacities around it and became part of the nomenclature of the common law. This was just plain, uncontroversial, easy language that lawyers have long used in the articulation of how we interact with each other and what claims can be made upon the neighbor and what prediction we have about what the courts will do if the neighbor fails to discharge those obligations. But Christian theologians and philosophers and ethicists, as we'll hear in the course of this day, have been more reserved and more troubled about rights talk. Yes, it was easy for Christians from the start to claim freedom, especially religious freedom, the more they were persecuted, the more Christians pressed for what the Edict of Milan of 313 eventually called liberty of conscience and free exercise rights of individuals and groups. But other forms of public and private and penal and procedural rights have long given a number of serious Christians real pause. 
And a number of Christians still today, as we're going to hear, view human rights as a kind of a dangerous secular invention, even a fiction, predicated on a celebration of reason over revelation, of greed over charity, of nature over scripture, of the individual over community, of the pretended sovereignty of humanity over the absolute sovereignty of God. And the goal of this forum is to take some of these questions and wrestle with them anew, summoning the wisdom of a half dozen leading philosophers and theologians and ethicists and jurists whom we'll be privileged to hear today in two admittedly long but very fruitful sessions. In our first session, we're going to be hearing from three philosophical and theological giants in the world. Professors Stanley Hauerwas, Nigel Bigger, and Robert Franklin. Full biographies and bibliographies of these giants are summarized in your program and then available on our website. I'm going to be brutally brief in the introduction of them with no attempt to deprecate their extraordinary achievements, but simply to get out of the way so you can hear them instead of hearing me, who is no giant, I assure you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.